Right. Now, um, what I'm going to talk about is over the sorry, I'll just make sure this is right. And over the last probably two years, we've seen a, a huge increase in the amount of work that has come in from China. We typically, we've been involved in say probably four or five projects a year for the last couple of years. Um, they tend to be kind of fairly large, kind of mixed-use master plans. There tends to be a lot of time pressure. Um, we're brought in as a consultant. We work most of the time with a local architect in Beijing. Now, we've already heard a lot about the kind of the background to the growth. The urban population in China has increased by 300 million or more in the last um, 30, 40 years. Um, Chengdu is kind of one example, one good example of that. You can see populations increased from around 2 million in the mid-60s all the way up to kind of 14, 15 million now. Our main concern is that the way that this urban growth is being accommodated within the cities through the kind of peripheral growth, the way that I think Daryl mentioned this kind of economic model of subdividing land, parceling it up and selling it on to individual um, developers, this method for accommodating the growth is creating potentially lots and lots of problems that will come back in the future. Um, it's something that it's a kind of a once a very rare opportunity that the city is growing this quickly. These are the bits of the city that are going to be there for 50, 100 years in time. Um, we need to get these things right now, otherwise we're going to have lots of problems later on. Now, we've looked at a number of projects in the last couple of years, but there are four or five really key, consistent questions that come up again and again and again. So I'm really going to run through what these questions are and what some of the ways are that we've been able to respond to it. Now, the first thing is kind of how big are these projects? And it's more that it's more typically, it's, people say this in the office, like, how big is this? Because it's really, often it's a kind of a scale which is completely different to what we're used to dealing with in this country. Now, in some ways, a lot of the kind of planning context is there. Often there is a regional plan that might identify centres, sub-centres, growth corridors, kind of strategic connections between different bits of the city. There will be a structural plan for kind of key parts of this. This is actually um, the city of Jiading on the edge of Shanghai, and often will be given a master plan. Now, this will be something that comes often from the government. The architect will be starting to develop this in a bit more detail. So the first thing is to say, okay, in some ways, this kind of planning context gives you a slightly misleading idea of the scale of this thing. You look at it and you think, maybe this spine that runs from north to south might be walkable. Um, we know it's big, but maybe you could go from one end to the other. Often, the thing which is really useful is to actually compare it to an existing city. This is Barcelona. I had to check this earlier today because I wasn't sure that the, the red outline was the proper, had been drawn properly. Um, it's four kilometers from, sorry, which is the, it's, it's four kilometers from here to here. And our site was something like four and a half kilometers. So this is an area which is being proposed. This is the master plan which is proposed for an area which is that size. So already you get some idea of the scale of what is being proposed, but also the difference in the level of complexity of what is actually there, the density of streets, the, the block sizes again, which was something that Daryl picked up, the different kind of quarters that you have, the very gothic, the, the different bits of the city. The second part of it is to say, and again, this is the outline of another project over Barcelona, um, there was a local, what was called a local spine proposed through the centre of the site. When you start to look at it, you see actually that local spine is the length of the diagonal. In fact, it's longer than the diagonal in Barcelona, which is a huge, a huge, enormous street. If you start to look at that in terms of what does this, what does this mean for town centres, public transport, and things like this, again, make a comparison to London. This is Edgware Road. Um, you can see there's probably six or seven really fairly significant centres which are along the length of this project. There's also uh, a fairly dense public transport network that begins to link you into central London but also between some of these other places. So the first question is um, how do you begin to get to grips with the scales of some of these things and often it's through beginning to do some of these kind of precedent studies. Now the next thing that again this, this tends to be a trend in the work that we've been involved in it doesn't mean that the same thing is happening everywhere but what we're often seeing is that it's sites on the edge of a city and often um, the master plan that's proposed will be something that ignores almost everything which is there already. So the question that we always ask is, why are we doing this from scratch? Now we looked at, this was Jardim, this, this is the area that's the size of Barcelona. Um, there were some bits of existing infrastructure that were proposed to be kept. 
there were some bits of kind of um, important routes that we wanted to keep, but the, there's, the general approach was to say, okay, we can almost redevelop this whole thing. We don't really need to look at it in too much detail. When you actually start to look at this area, um, this, for some reason I don't understand why this happens, but almost all of the industrial buildings have got a blue roof. So from here you can see where all the industrial uses are really easy to see. So there's one thing which is happening. There's some existing infrastructure. There's a lot of industrial uses, and the plan is to move some of the industrial uses. The other thing that you can see, it, sorry, it's difficult to see on this image, but there's a whole network of canals which is running through this site, and they're going all the way through here, along the edges here, along these bits. Now, the proposed master plan that we were looking at initially, in some cases, it engaged with these canals. In other cases, these were just bits at the back of blocks. And in some cases, they had moved the canals completely or kind of filled them in. There's also, you see these really dense little, little bits of um, small buildings here. These were existing urban villages. Some of these, you can only access if you go through the industrial uses. Um, some of them, you've got access through the kind of primary network. But a lot of them, in fact, all of them are linked together by this network of canals. So you have this really interesting combination of three different layers of networks all coming together at the site at the same time. There's problems with kind of all of them. There's the existing route network. It's fragmented. Um, there's only a few routes that link everything together. It doesn't really connect into the surrounding areas at all. But you can see there's the canal network, which explains some of these gaps between it. And then there's the urban villages picked out in red. Now, the starting point was to say, we've got all of these constraints. Rather than ignoring all of it, why don't we start to work with it? Partly, um, you might be able to develop something which is a bit more interesting. One of the first ideas was to start to use the canals and to say, rather than um, removing some of them or putting them at the back of blocks, what, could we incorporate this in the public realm? Could we use this as something that will give this area some kind of unique characteristics, which a lot of the other master plan developments in these areas don't have. So there was an idea that we could start to fix some of the issues with the, with the root structure by combining, bringing the, the um, network of canals into the public realm and aligning the two structures together. There was the second issue, which was the um, urban villages. There's a whole set of issues which are connected to the initial master plan we were looking at you couldn't deliver the whole master plan without acquiring all of the urban villages, and that would have meant acquiring the houses, um, relocating people. It would mean demolishing some of the areas which they, they might have kind of heritage value, they might be worth keeping. What we tried to do, or what we managed to do, was to align a proposed new spatial structure, um, develop it around the urban villages, maintain the canal network, and inc incorporate all of these things together. Now, this was something that started to challenge some of the... Um, some of the concepts that were in the master plan from the, the kind of higher government level that we were given. Um, initially, the, the architects that we were talking to in Beijing were a bit worried about some of these ideas, but this was something we did in December 2011. Um, one of the ways that we were able to kind of start to um, convince them that it was a good idea was almost to look at what are the, what are the other benefits that we think we can bring to it. It's a fairly inefficient master plan to begin with. Almost 60% of your space is, is basically open, undevelopable space. It's things like roads, canals, public space. If you can incorporate the canals in your public realm strategy, you can save 10% of your space, which means that you've got potentially 10% to put into other, um, other um, land uses or other development. Now, it was t 2011 when we put that together. We didn't hear anything for a really long time. And then last week, well, a couple of weeks ago, this was selected out of three master plans as the, the winning proposal for that site. So that was a really um, interesting process. Now, this is something that comes up again and again. How do I cross the road? We've seen that there was this issue that a lot of the major urban growth happens through... Um, large-scale pieces of infrastructure being built by the government and individual plots being sold off and developed individually within that. Now, the problem with this is that um, if you're looking at just the connections through the route network between two places which are actually quite close together, if you were following just the roads, the length of the journeys that you have to get to link those places is actually really far. Because you've got a layer of infrastructure which doesn't provide any secondary structure or doesn't coordinate between 
these two different areas, um, you put a lot more pressure on this primary network. So because there are, there are little bits of disconnected um, subdivisions, um, which really, the only way you can link them is by using these main roads. Um, and the main roads often look like this. This might be slightly, slightly wider than a lot of them. This was Changchun. There's five lanes on one side of this row of trees. There's another five lanes going the other way. Again, each of those, those bits has a two-lane slip road on each, each side as well. These are huge bits of infrastructure. Um, one of the issues is that in a lot of the, the cities, these roads will be divided by this kind of white um, fence which runs down the middle, which means that it's almost impossible to cross the road unless you're at a junction. So not only does it mean that your journeys by car are much longer because you have to follow the bits of network which are there, but also if you're walking from here to here, it's almost impossible to cross the road unless you're at a junction. So it makes both of those sets of journeys longer, puts more pressure on that motorway network. You get yeah, longer journeys, um, more journeys by car, it increases congestion and it increases energy use. So these seem like fairly small um, design decisions about whether how you divide a road in half, where you put pedestrian crossings, but they can have a huge effect on a much, a much wider scale issue. Um, how do you get around that? Um, rather than looking at all of these subdivisions individually, you have to try and start to put some secondary structure together Maybe these roads need to be designed differently. There shouldn't be motorways. Um, maybe they should follow a different mode where actually it's all right for the traffic to stop. It doesn't have to be moving at 70 miles an hour the whole time up to the next junction. It can slow down and you can have more crossings linking these things together. Um, okay, what about bikes? This is from, I think this is Beijing in 1986. Um, I think we have heard that the amount of um, the number of people using bikes has decreased as there's been an increase in, um, in wealth and as people have started to, to aspire to move in different ways, maybe owning personal cars and private cars and things like this. Um, although there is a declining trend in use of bikes, one of the issues that we're concerned about is that the way that the subdivisions are designed actually doesn't allow this trend to be easily reversed in future. So the, the issue that we were just looking at of a lack of secondary route structure. If we take this area as an example, again, this is a huge area. This is something like um, probably eight kilometers across. If you were cycling within here, the only possible routes that connect one side to the other are these ones which are red. These are also gonna have to be taking all of the um, car traffic as well. So it's gonna make it an unpleasant um, environment to cycle in. It's also making the journeys longer, again, as we saw before. What can you do about it? Um, make sure that you develop a well-connected, structured um, um, spatial network, ties into the surrounding areas, it provides, it's, it distributes movement within <coughs> the area that you're looking at itself as well. Now there's a second part to this as well, and this might be a kind of interesting discussion point. Um, in the UK, what we have found is that cycle use, you get higher use, um, higher levels of cycling on the routes which are more direct and better connected even if these routes are kind of busy um, and have got a lot of traffic and are maybe more, more unpleasant. And the most well-connected use, or the, the, the kind of more accessible the route, that accounts for roughly kind of half of cycling movement. You find about half of that proportion comes from um, providing cycling infrastructure. Now that might be something which is specific to the UK. It might be because um, the UK doesn't have such a culture. We saw that image in Beijing from 1986, just of how many bikes there were. It might be that in cities in China, people are more used to driving alongside huge numbers of cyclists and that the, cycling, the actual infrastructure for cycling is less important. Um, certainly what we're seeing in London is that the most important thing is that there's a route which is direct and well connected. If there's infrastructure, it helps, but it's not the, the main thing. Now the last bit that we come to is saying, why is this here? Um, I think Alistair picked up in the introduction some of the things which you see quite, reg well, quite regularly you hear about in the UK architecture press and even in the kind of national press. You have things like copies of Austrian villages. Um, we've, I think actually there's two Eiffel Towers in China. I think there's one in Shanghai. I think there's one uh, somewhere else as well. Um, We've got, this was the Corbusian um, barbecue restaurant, which I think this was actually knocked down a year or so ago after a complaint from a, a Corbusier society. 
and then you get copies of things like the mini gherkin, <laughs> selfridges. This, the, there's, I think there's a really serious issue or question behind this, which is not the issue of copyright so much, but um, the fact that I think during the... There's another statistic that I've heard a few times, which is that the recent economic growth has seen the demolition of more traditional buildings than during the Cultural Revolution, which happened before that. Now, a lot of these kind of traditional buildings are being replaced by things like this. Um, I think the issue is not so much copyright, but the issue is that there's bits of um, heritage and kind of urban heritage which are being lost and being replaced with uh, stuff which might not be the highest quality. We have seen some things improving about that. We have seen that people have started to identify buildings which have got um, heritage value and have started to develop master plans around that. But I think there's another option, an, or a second kind of level to this conversation, which is um, why are there not um, specific typologies developing in relation to some of the conditions in China? You hear stories about um, Beijing and the hutongs, and a lot of the hutongs, the, the houses there, don't have their own bathrooms. They don't have access to certain services. Um, there's shared bathrooms which might be used by, I don't know, a whole street of houses. Um, we've often heard stories about people being offered to move out of the hutong so they can be redeveloped, and they would be um, rehoused in a new development on the edge of the city or in a, what would be called modern housing. But people are really um, hesitant to leave behind the hutongs. So I guess the question is, where, where are the, um, do we need to think about different typologies which are specific to China and how are things like this accommodated in the kind of proposals which are happening now? So that is very quickly the kind of five key questions um, and the, the things that we keep asking again and again and again on the projects that we're looking at. <coughs>